This is a pleasure. I get to talk to another Hall of Famer who played for the New Orleans Saints. He also played college football at Louisiana Tech. He toiled a little with the Chiefs at the end of his career. Willie Rope. How you doing, Willie? Good. How you doing today? Great. I see that uh, you went to college at Louisiana Tech, but you were born in Arkansas. How did you end up out there in Louisiana? Uh, as, as you know, back then, um, uh, the Razorbacks were uh, kind of rebuilding, but we had had, I'm from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, same hometown as Toy Hunter, same high school as Toy, Toy Hunter, the baseball player that was in the playoffs this year for the Detroit Tigers. And what happened was, we had a couple guys that were very, very good football players, a quarterback named Eric Mitchell that went to Oklahoma and uh, Danny Bradley, and uh, Curtis Williams in the defensive tackle. So when those guys did that, Arkansas got a little bit pissed off with uh, with, uh, <laughs> with with the Pablo Zebra program and uh, didn't recruit us as heavily. So, uh, you know, I, my problem was I was playing basketball also, so I wasn't but about 225 pounds coming out of high school, but I had big hands and big feet. And... Uh, I uh, didn't get recruited real heavily because of my because of my size, and I think also because of uh, what had happened with some of the other schools. So, were you better at basketball or football? You no, know, my bloodline was uh, definitely football. Uh, I was kind of raw at basketball; I had some potential, and I really did probably had a little more of a love for basketball. But uh, things happened for a reason, and. Uh, um, my basketball coach, I went to UCA when Scotty Pippen came out. Uh, Scotty Pippen's from Hamburg, Arkansas. So when he went to UCA, obviously he was he went pro, and uh, that was uh, everybody looked up to him that was growing up at the time in the state of Arkansas. I went to basketball camp. There's about 400 campers up there, and I was a real good rebounder. I got missed the rebound at camp, got offered a scholarship to UCA, then I got off, of, and then back then, back in that time, I don't know if you guys remember high school basketball tournaments, but one of the biggest ones in the country was called the King Cotton Classic, and that was on ESPN. They, had, they played a couple games on ESPN in 87, 88. Dick, Val, Dick Vitale came and did the tournament down there in Pine Bluff, and uh, we met him at, at our luncheon and everything. So uh, we played the King Cotton and uh, got a lot of exposure had teams from all over the country played in it. Jason Kidd, uh, uh, Dennis Scott when he played for Flint Hill, Aaron Bain, uh, J.R. Reed, to name a few guys that played in that tournament. But it was a huge high school basketball tournament. And um, like I said, I started playing basketball in about the seventh, eighth grade, and I started playing football, you know, from street ball from uh, I don't know how, but when I was about 10 years old, organized. So, uh, you know, I had a love for basketball, but. You know, I'm about six four and five eight, maybe six five, and uh, you know, I would, I, I, I thought it was better just to take the football scholarship and go down to Louisiana Tech, and uh, ended up being a blessing in disguise. So you weren't looking at Arkansas because they had a pretty good team back then with Nolan Richardson. Oh uh, well, no, 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 Arkansas didn't recruit me. No, I was just going to scholarship, man. I was, you know, it was. Uh, I, no, I had the smaller schools. I got letters from Connecticut. When Calhoun had just got there, I got a letter from Connecticut. Uh, uh, I guess they had heard about me at the camp in uh, in, uh, in in 1988 when he was just taking over at, at UConn. But uh, I don't. Know. My basketball coach eventually let me know recently that he didn't let me get, he didn't let me see all the letters I had gotten. So I don't know I don't know how many offers I had in basketball because he didn't want me. You know, my dad and him, you know, knew knew that I was really a football player. And, uh, and and they didn't tell me all the letters I got in basketball, so you know I took the football scholarship. And, and back that back in back in, even in the, in in, the, in most of the country, uh, if you remember back then, we ran the flex ball, which you had two or three backs in the backfield. You passed the ball a little bit, but you ran the ball. Arkansas, Arkansas State, all these football programs, OU, all ran in Nebraska, all did all this running. So the problem with their linemen was they didn't know how to pass the tech when they got to the NFL. Well, what happened to me, I ended up going to lose their, lose their tech with Bradshaw and, and all these uh, uh, quarterbacks and, and um, a lot of receivers came out of. And, you know, Bobby Brister, Stan Humphreys went to Northeast, but it's known for, it's known for airing the ball out. 
So it was black. I ended up going down to Louisiana Tech, and Joe Ferguson was on the staff. Stinger Insminger was there, Pat Tilly. We were in a pro set office, so we flip-flopped. I had to learn how to play both tackles, and we passed the ball a lot. So, the, you know, the, the system and, and the basketball skills that I did have with the foot and feet movement and the system that I got to go underneath and learn from, and my line coach, Petey P. Rowe, played in the league also, was, was, was basically – the, the perfect situation for somebody with, with my type of skill set, and uh, I blossom on the program. Now, your late mother was the first African American uh, Supreme Court justice in Arkansas, yes, and she she was born in Columbus, Ohio, where they have a university to play some football. She went to Michigan State. I would have thought somehow you could have ended up in the Big Ten. Uh, my dad did make a call to Michigan State. Uh, at Michigan State, and Arkansas both asked me to walk on. My dad played at Michigan State. That's how my dad ended up meeting my mom. My dad was an outstanding athlete too. He was he was all state football and basketball and co and, and co valedictorian of his high school, Merrill High School, and ended up going up to play at Michigan State. Met my mom up there on a blind date. They both were zoology majors, and uh, my dad ended up going to Howard, holding his knee, and ended up graduating and going to Howard Dental School in. Um, in Washington, D.C., and then they moved down to Palm of Arkansas. My mom worked at the Arsenal, which uh, dealt with the military and, and, and uh, lab, lab work because they were both zoology majors. And then after I was born, my mom decided to go to uh, law school in Little Rock. I have a younger brother, but after I was born and he was a little baby, she decided to go to law school in Little Rock and I think graduated second in her class and. uh that's when a law career took off. Palm Bluff to Little Rock is about 35, 40 minutes. And uh, she did that commute every day and, and uh, became an outstanding lawyer. I remember she, before she left that law firm, she, she was a lawyer. She did the books for the law firm. She did the accounting for my, for my she did the taxes for my, my family, but she also did the taxes for the law firm. So my mom was a very, very, very smart woman and very well-rounded and, um, and, uh, you know, really, really established herself. In fact, this past weekend, I won in the Arkansas Black Hall of Fame with my mother. Uh, and us and another pair were the first uh, uh, family members to go in the Arkansas Black, Black Hall of Fame. So I had a great honor of uh, following my mama in that Hall of Fame in Little Rock, Arkansas. What happened to your dad? How did they leave him out? You know my, you know what? My, <laughs> my, dad, my dad belongs to My dad... Uh, uh, my dad grew up in a very tough situation and had, you know, nine, you know the story, eight, nine brothers and sisters in an impoverished situation. Uh, grew up, you know, having to pick cotton and, and work hard and went to college, put him on a train in college with $20 in his pocket. And my mom's family really took him in and helped him out. And uh, my dad and my, and my uncle decided to come back to Pine Bluff and open up a practice. So if you wanted your teeth, teeth pulled, you went on that side to see my dad. <laughs> if you wanted to get checked out, uh, uh, by OBGYN, you went to the other side to see my uncle. So they had an OBGYN dentist practice together for years and really went back and did, did a lot for that community. Uh, my dad was on the school board 20-some years, and uh, it, it's really been a, a fine example, you know, from what he grew up and what he went back and gave back to the community. And he continues to do today. Uh, he's, he's about to retire, but he's 71, still going going strong and uh, still lives in Pine Bluff and, and uh, he, he's a pillar in that community. So uh, what my dad achieved and, and what my family, what my family down there in general has been able to achieve is uh, is uh, has been has been remarkable. You know the, you know I guess they say people look at the Huxtables and uh, I guess we're kind of the example of <laughs> of the Huxtable family in real life. <laughs> you get drafted the eighth overall pick in the 1993 draft by the New Orleans Saints. Had you anticipated being that high a selection? Were you expecting that? Um, I remember, I remember, um, <clears throat> uh, Hokey Gajan was with the Saints and asked about me when I was the red shirt freshman. And, uh, they always told me, even when I got there, as athletic as I was, you know, if you do what you're going to do, well, you'll be wearing diamonds. Coach P. Rowe, Coach, Coach Joe Uh always told me, 
always, you know, told me, Willie, you got a lot of potential. When I first got there, they knew I had a lot of potential, and uh, I didn't understand it. And I told them, man, I'm I'm 235 pounds. I'm never going to be 300 pounds. <laughs> and uh, my red shirt, fret, my red shirt, sophomore year, we played against Maryland in the Independence Bowl, and we were eight and three, and they were uh, they had a real good team. They had Larry Webster and Scott Zolak and uh, Clarence Jones, who I ended up playing with. They had three or four, you know, pro prospects on that team, and one of them was on defense, Larry Webster. And um, we ended up tied them in the, in the Independence Bowl, and I knew those guys were going pro, and I watched Clarence Jones and play. And I think at that time I was maybe in the top 40 tackles, and, and, and I was, you know, 20, 20, 21 years old. And I realized then, I said, man, if I if I, if I I stay, take care of my business and, and do what I got to do in the schoolroom and, and stay in college, I said, I said, I'm going to have a chance to go pro. I, you know, it wasn't until my senior year, uh, my, after my junior year, I took the invitation to the Hula Bowl, so I knew I was going to go play in the Hula Bowl instead of the Senior Bowl, and uh, that was a blessing until I got to know Eddie Robinson, the, the legendary coach from Grambling, mm-hmm. and Lou Holtz were my coaches in the Hula Bowl after my senior year in Hawaii, and, uh, and, and me and Eddie Robinson became real good friends. I used to go check on him. Cause I had a golf tournament, you know, losing that tech and and I'm on the right beside each other, like four miles from each other, or Rustin, I mean. So anyway, um, uh, my senior going into my senior year, I had like a we we have combine rating. I had like a six zero combine rating, and that in the, in the year before that, Lincoln Kennedy in in uh, in the University of Washington with Steve Entman and, and Quentin Coryard and those guys that went won won the uh, Rose Bowl. So st- so so. So Lincoln had a 7.0 rating going into our senior year. Uh, Lincoln probably could have, should have come out as if he'd gone come out as junior, he'd have been a top five pick. That was the year Bob Woodfield came out. He was the, he was a number eight pick. So uh, going into my senior year, I was looking at Lincoln and and, and looking at guys on the charge. It was Lincoln. It was me. It was Ty Perry. It was uh, uh, Brad Hopkins. There was a couple more guys that there were. All of us were bunched up together after Lincoln. So my deal was to go out there and establish myself and, and work my way up the ladder. I couldn't get an insurance policy at the beginning of the year, Lord of London, for $500,000. It was like five. I forget the amount that I was trying to get, but at the beginning of the year, I couldn't get a policy. After we played Alabama, and I had that game against Curry and Copeland, and, and um, I think we played in Birmingham. We didn't go to Tuscaloosa. After I played Alabama, and they had, you know, two top ten prospects and, you know, George T. London, all those guys on defense that went ended up going pro. After I had that game against Curry, um, my stock went up, and and I knew then I, when I when I came to practice that next week, and we had scouts. You know, they used to be following you around practice. It would be seven, eight of them, ten of them out there just watching you on the practice field, watching you in practice. After 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 the, after that game, I got an insurance policy and my stock went up and uh, we ended up having four guys drafted from my school because we had the number two defense in the country behind Alabama and we had a real good program. Uh, so uh, it, it it was it was a lot of fun back then and and uh, so I didn't realize I had a chance to go pro to to the, to my sophomore year, well, rest of sophomore year, but it was during the course of my senior years when 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 my stock rose. I thought the Bears were going to take in that draft, but <clears throat> at the last second, they took Curtis Conway right before you. And I thought I, I was slotted anywhere between five and eight, so it was it was it was Tampa Bay, it was uh, it was Tampa Bay, it was it was it was uh, uh, Cincinnati, it was the Bears, and it was Detroit. And what happened? Uh, Detroit so traded the pick to the uh, Saints, and um, that's how I ended up for Pat Swilling. And broke the dome pole up because Ricky Jackson's last year was my my year, and uh, that's how I ended up going. That's how I ended up becoming a Saint. Uh, the Saints traded that pick, and they took me. And in the fourth round, with the other pick, they took Lorenzo Neal, one of the best fullbacks to ever play the game. What did they feed you at Louisiana Tech to get you as big as you got? <laughs> um, you know, it's just the way the genetics are. I mean, I didn't really drink a lot of beer in high school. You know, uh, I went to, I'm, I, you know, I grew up in Arkansas. I went to Louisiana. Uh, we had the training table, so uh, we ate, we ate, and uh, we worked out. 
my red when I got to tech I was two thirty five. My red shirt year I played about two fifty. So I gained about ten or fifteen pounds, but you gotta understand I was lifting weights. You know, I never lifted weights like that. I went from see what happened was when football season over in high school, you go straight to basketball. Well, then I played basketball, and then in the offseason, I would lift a little bit, but I never did lift seriously because I didn't want to get, I didn't want to, I didn't know whether I wanted to play football or basketball, so I wasn't going to gain a lot of weight in high school. I wasn't trying to gain a lot of weight. So, like I said, I was 220. I was really lean my senior playing football because I went to basketball camp that summer at UCA and played a whole lot of basketball, gyms all over Conway, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, when I got to college, I mean, I told them I wanted to play basketball at Tech too. Once I got there, I realized that wasn't going to happen. But uh, between the training table and uh, you know just enjoying college life, uh, I put on about you know you put on you know fifteen, twenty, fifteen pounds in my redshirt year. I was about two fifty, two fifty five, and then uh, my redshirt sophomore year I was about two seventy, two sixty five. So every year I gradually put on ten or fifteen pounds. And um, I was going to come out my red shirt junior year. I was about 290, and I decided to stay stay for my senior year. But uh, I could run. You know, I could run. You know, I think I ran like a 4 eight something uh, for my for my coach, a couple on grass. So I was going – I thought about leaving, but uh, I'm glad I stayed. You know, I mean, even though I started those three years, you know, I wanted to come out, but I didn't. But uh, I was just – I was – Blessed with a lot of ability, and and our strength coach Joe Taylor was like the guy at Alabama. I don't know if you saw the special. He was real intense. I mean, we could miss class, but we couldn't miss a workout. So <laughs> uh, between, I wasn't a squatter, but I was very, very good. I, I never squatted over five hundred some pounds, and I got beat in bench by the linebacker, Martin Baker, who got drafted in the fourth round to the Chicago Bears. My, I came into college bench in two seventy five. I left benching about four fifty. Wow. I got beat by the linebacker. Mine benched like four fifty five, four sixty. But I was real good at power clean. I power clean three seventy from the floor. I like the snatch, but I was the explosive lifting, the power clean, the, the Olympic liftings were really good for me. And and if and as I got bigger, I got quicker. You know because of the Olympic lifting and the you know you do your bounding, you're skipping, you run all your drills. But I I, I was blessed with the quickness. Speed and power, that whole combination. You know, some some guys are quick and they're not fast. Some guys are big. You know, you, but I was just one of those guys that was very quick and very fast. What was big man? Or big man? You ever try to convince your coaches that you should be a fullback? <laughs> no, no, we didn't really need a fullback. And uh, I mean, I, I mean, if you ask Bill Cool here, I was. Um, I mean, I was I was a prototypical left tackle, six five, three fifteen, three ten. By the time I was in the league, I mean, some guys like him a little bigger, you know, uh, uh, you know, not six eight, six nine like Ogden, but you know, six five, six six, you know, is a is a good size for a lineman, you know, with long arms. You know, you need to play. Mm-hmm. Well, back then, I mean, guys are even the ends aren't quite as big. You need to have. Long arms to get people off of you. You know, when I got trained to Kansas City, that was the thing about John Tate. John Tate was a tough guy, hard worker. He's taller than me, but he didn't have long arms, and uh, that's what hindered him playing left tackle. And I, I, I even remember when I played left tackle, guys like either guys with power gave me trouble. A guy like Sprini or DT just wanted to run around me. Uh, I liked a guy like that. A guy with Sean Jones, Tim Harris, with those long, long arms. Longer than mine would give me, would give me problems, or a guy with power. But but you know that that was uh, you know you learn how to play the position in the pros. But that that was it. You know you needed those long arms to keep those guys out your chest. What about a Bruce Smith? Bruce Smith didn't really use his power. You know I I and, and, and I, I I can say I was fortunate. The only time I played against Bruce Smith and we went in it when he was trying to uh, show out a little bit was uh, in the Pro Bowl. And I got after him a little bit, and he got a little pissed at me, you know, at the game. But, you know, it's the Pro Bowl. We, we, we're going to have a good time, hang out on the beach. But, uh, we, you know, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I'm not trying to get crazy in, in this Pro Bowl game because, you know, you don't want to get hurt over there and, and, and mess up your salary the next year. So, 
you know, my thing was if the guys were kind of low-key, you know, in the Pro Bowl, you know, Simeon Rice came. I can tell you a story. Simeon came up to me, and I'm, I'm coming in the lobby. And uh, Simeon, I guess they had just won that Super Bowl in Tampa Bay. So this must have been 2002. So Simeon called me over. He said, uh, hey, Willie. He said, uh, you know, we, we're going to play the, play the game. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, I got a shoulder injury and, uh, and, 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 and you know, he's it, in the contract situation. So, you know, basically saying I'm not going to be going crazy in the game. And I said, okay, everything, you know. And basically, if, if you're not going to go crazy and go hard, then, you know, we, we, we'll give some effort, but we're not going to try to hurt each other out in the promo right. game. And, and that's the respect guys have for each other. Now, I'm not saying you're supposed to get out there and patty cake like they did a couple of years ago, <laughs> but guys understand that, you know, if you've got a chance to make, you know, especially now, back then it was three, three, four million dollar base salary. I'm not going to risk it in a game where, you know, I'm making twenty or forty thousand dollars. Right. John Randall talked about he used to talk trash during all these games to get in the offensive lineman's head. Well, you, you, you had you, you know, the thing is, as the as the game goes, it picks up. So it might be slow, and guys are you know a little hungover or whatever <laughs> the first half, or you know sweating it out. You know, by third quarter, you know it, it's picking up. Guys are coming harder. You're not supposed to blitz. You're only supposed to rush floor. You're not supposed to bring a linebacker. You're not supposed to do, you know, there's certain rules you have in the Pro Bowl game that you did in the, they're not in the regular season. You can't bring a blitz. You can't bring a linebacker. You can't bring a cornerback. You know, you can't do certain things to keep, keep, keep it kind of basic. But as the game gets more intense, you know, that, that fire comes out, and sometimes guys are going to go harder. And then you have some guys, you know, that are trying to get the MVP. So, you, you know, you have guys that are trying to show out, even though it's an all-star game. And usually, if you, if you notice the MVP, it's usually a receiver or a running back because they're putting up crazy numbers because it's an all-star game. Or a quarterback that's, that's putting up big numbers. It's not usually a defensive guy that's got a bunch of sacks or a guy that's got a bunch of tackles. It's usually the MVP's an offensive player because it's, it's so it's generic and guys are going to put up big numbers in that game. Now, in your rookie season, you started all 16 games. Did you know coming into camp that the job was yours? I, did, I didn't I did miss a down my rookie season. And um, uh, this uh, another story. Uh, I, came to, I came to New Orleans, and uh, Tootie Robbins had been playing with the Green Bay Packers for a long time. And uh, we signed Tootie Robbins back then to a one-year contract. So I think they were expecting Tootie Robbins to play right tackle that year. Well, Tootie Robbins was a 13-year vet, and he had been in Green Bay. Well, he came down to New Orleans, and we we went to training camp in lacrosse, but Jim Moore's an ex-Marine. So uh, Tootie had a trick shoulder. And um, before, after about a week of practice or whatever, I, I forget how many days it was, he, he popped that shoulder out. And uh, we, went, we had to play five preseason games my rookie year. We played in the Japan Bowl. Uh, against the Philadelphia Eagles, so when I got over to got over to Japan, I started in the preseason game, my first preseason game, and I did a pretty good job at right tackle. And um, they ended up, they got, and back then that was a lot of money. They gave two thousand five hundred thousand dollars, and they released him, and he went back to Green Bay and played his last year. Wow, what was Jim Moore like as a coach? <laughs> uh, tough, very tough. Uh, Jim Moore, I remember one year Jim Moore fell out at practice, fell out at practice, got up, didn't leave the field, and we continued to practice. Jim Moore came to his house one time in New Orleans. A lot of people don't know this story. Jim Moore pulled up in his house. They had an intruder in his house. Jim Moore, I don't even know if he called the police. His wife was in the house. Jim Moore went in his house and confronted an intruder in his house. Uh, with his wife, because his wife was there, and got the intruder out of his house. Jim Moore was 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 a was a, was a tough man, was a hard man. Uh, uh, um, you know, like I said, that Marine man mentality. We were gonna be in shape, and if we got out there some weeks and we and it was hot in the war, it was hot and humid. It wasn't hot in the cars, but it was hot when we got back. If we got back and we would be a little lack of day to go in practice. He wouldn't stop to say, um, 
He didn't like what was going on to start it over. We would have started off from stretch, but we would start it off from the first period, and we start practice over if he didn't like it. And then later on you have uh, and more out it. Mike, Mike, I Mike Dick did Vermeil get Vermeil at the end, and, he was, and we practiced long and hard with Dick Vermeil too. It was it was it was tough. Uh, but yeah, we were we were in shape. We were spe- especially for what we were trying to do. The only problem was later in my career, even when I was younger in my career, when you the, the problem I don't think they really understood is, is those type of coaches. Well, well problem well, later in our career, we had a veteran team, and I was the oldest one on offense, and uh, that you know. But when you do a lot of banging and 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 and, 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 and you and you and you hit you use your body like that. And training camp, it gets you in shape and it gets you ready to play. But for the first couple of weeks of the season, you're tired. You're trying to get your legs back underneath you when you when you're playing. If if you notice, when I played, we always played Denver very very early in the season because because uh, because because uh, Shanahan knew he wanted to play us early in Denver in Mile High. He already knew we were going to be banging a lot more than they were at camp because he, the vet, the, 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 the old, if you're over 30, you don't even go two days. And, you, and what he believed in, he believed in doing a lot of running without the pads on and working on your conditioning. He wanted you to be in shape. He didn't believe in all the banging. Well, they knew we were doing all the banging, so they want to play us early in the year up in Mount High and run us out, run us, run us out, run us off the field. So we would always get beat up there early and play them in September. We would always play them at home in November. By that time, we we were we were out of camp and we were we were in we were rolling by the end. So we would always beat them late in the year. But they would always schedule us early in the year and play us early in the year because they knew that we was you know we were going to be you your body would be sore you know for a while. You you would you know when some of those times, especially when it was more, you know Jim Dombrowski held out of camp my rookie year and he was a transition player. So I think Moore kept us in two days for – we would have Sunday off, but, but we would hit every day, twice a day. And and, and, and then um, Jim came in late, so we stayed in pass. I mean, I, I remember, especially coming from Louisiana Tech, our season was over in November, I was so physically drained. I wasn't going out. I was going home and sleeping and getting my rest, but I was so tired. Uh, Joe, Joe Veragano, the special teams coach, I would go lay on his couch – some some days and just take a nap because my body was it was just 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 I wasn't used to it. So you know, for me to play every down, I played every down my first three and a half years until I until I hurt my knee in '96. But for me to get out there and play every down, uh, uh, I, I was uh, physically very tired. I got used to it my second year. You know, I got used to the schedule and used to it more. But my rookie year was very very hard because. Uh, I wasn't used to all that hitting, and I wasn't used to, you know, playing football that long. And it, 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 it's, it's tough. It's very tough. But, uh, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I had a very productive rookie year, and uh, I played real good against some of the best. Reggie White, um, you know, Kevin Green got my first NFL sack on me. But, you know, I got off to a great start in the NFL and made sure I got in camp on time, and that was the key. But uh, it, it, was a, it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of big – it was a lot of – uh, moaning and complaining going on. We had a tent out there, and, and, and when we were at lacrosse, we called it the bench tent. And we would sit out there. You come out there for that second practice, and you feel like you couldn't even barely walk on that football field. And it would be a lot of moaning and complaining, looking forward to that practice. But you had to do it. I mean, you know, just the way it was back then. It was you, you, you. These guys were tough. What was it like when Mike Dickey came in and coached? Uh, we worked hard with Dicker. Uh, I don't remember it being as hard as it was with Moore. I remember being tough, and we were hitting. But by that time, I'd been in the league for four or five years, so it wasn't as you know. I was used to the routine, uh, but we it, it was hard. Uh, you know, we had we had a tough year in '96, and in '97, uh, that was probably the worst. You know, more more left in the, during the season and. Uh, you know, I, I, the losing gets to you. You know, I mean, I, I 94, 95, I was lineman of the year. You know, all pro. We were both we were 79, two years in a row. 96, you know, we were three and 13, and then more. I mean, then uh, Mike Dicker comes in, and uh, 
you know, 97 was a, was a tough year for me. I, I wasn't in the best shape. You know, wasn't taking care of it. Was, it was a transition year for me. You know, either I was going to get myself together and really become a pro, or, or I was going to be out the league in a couple of years uh, if I didn't get it together. And, uh, you know, I, I needed I needed Dicker and I needed 97. You know, Dick Stanfield, the old legendary coach who was up for the Hall of Fame, I hope he does get in one day. Dick Stanfield was on that staff in, in 97 and 98. And uh, old Detroit line, uh, the great lineman, and uh, I'm so glad. I, I mean, he would get in there and run on the treadmill and do stuff, and you would see him working out and, and the way he pushed his body and, and the shape he was in, real good, real clean cut man. And, uh, you know, that 97 was a real tough year for me. Chuck Smith got after me when Atlanta came to town uh, uh, in 97. And after that, I went to Duke, and I really got in real good shape. I played a lot of basketball up there and uh and was doing a lot of running, and uh, I really got in got in real good shape and and, and played real hard in '98. Uh, you know, I, I really didn't want to let the team down, but I, you know, I wanted Coach Stanfield to be proud of me. And uh, and you know, after that '97 year, you know, I made sure before when I hurt my knee, before I got traded to uh, Kansas City, I paid for myself to go to Duke again and train. You know, uh, uh, Peyton Manning goes up there and has pass camp sometimes. It's, it's beautiful up there in that time of year and uh, up there in Raleigh dorm area. But um, uh, I wanted to make sure I was ready to play when I got to Kansas City in 2002. So, uh, you know, my thing was after that year, I was going to make sure that I was ready to play. And if I stepped on that football field, I was going to, uh, you know, give, give my best effort, you know, after, after the 97 year. I feel bad for Dick Stanfield. He was a finalist for the Hall of Fame when you were going in the Hall of Fame, and he didn't get it, and it's twice he's would, been a I, finalist. I, I would, and he wasn't the finalist the year after year because they 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 let old old, old Jack Butler in and Dick Stanfield, the the the, the, the nicest guy you could have. Uh, I I would stand beside him uh, every national national anthem that 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 '98 season, and uh, you know I, he, I think he I made him proud. I uh, went out there and played real hard. In 99, we got another coach, but I'm so glad that uh, I got to meet him and play underneath him. He's just a wonderful man, and he deserves to go in the Hall of Fame, and uh, I hope he does. I think he's still living in Chicago. I hope he I is. Hope he he's does. in Liberty. He's in Libertyville. He's about 20 minutes from here. Yeah, I, I hope. I hope they put him in. He's a great, great man. Great man to play for. What was it like when uh, Ricky Williams came to the Saints? A circus. <laughs> um, it was tough. It was tough that year. And Ricky came in '99. Um, first of all, they traded the whole draft for him, and then they, you know, put him in that wedding dress. And uh, <laughs> you, if you don't remember, they, and then and then he signs with Master P. So he gets the worst contract in NFL history. <laughs> then he then he's playing. Then he's talking about I'm gonna reach these numbers, these crazy numbers to get these incentives. He had to reach, I mean, it was, he had to rush for like 1,500 yards a couple of years. It was just astronomical numbers they put on him and, 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 and didn't, really give him, didn't really give him a lot of money up front for even the pink he got picked, okay? And, they, and, 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 and I mean, they took advantage of Ricky and, and, you know, were kind of laughing at him behind his back. So Ricky was very immature at that time. And I thought, watching Ricky play college football, the way he was perceived on TV, as good a football player was at college, I thought Ricky was a lot more mature than what he was. But Ricky just was a very immature, sensitive kid and uh, got it, got himself in a situation where, you know, he lashed, basically he was lashing out. The whole time he was there because of the contract, once he got there and, you know, he, he, was, he was lashing out, doing stuff, acting aloof on purpose, partially on purpose, because because he realized what, what had been done and, 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 and what, was he go, what was he going to do about it, you know. He really couldn't do anything about the situation with the contract they had him, and uh, it, it was it was bad, you know. It was, it, you know, you try to take a positive spin on it, but, I mean, they put that kid in a, in a real tough situation, and uh, and uh, it, it was it was you know in, in '99 before Dick had left uh, was another tough year and uh, you know I, I do remember going to Baltimore and playing against uh, Mike McCrary and uh, 
Johnny United standing on the sideline. How excited I was to be playing in front of Johnny United before the, before he passed away. But uh, uh, you know, Ricky, uh, I mean, that was a, that was a circus. You know, that was a circus. A lot, a lot of hoopla, but you know, it was a circus. And, and it took Ricky. Uh, you know, Ricky had a good year in 2000, and he got hurt. He had, uh, you know, I think he had a thousand yards in ten games. He was having a hell of a year, and we went to the playoffs and won the first playoff that game that year. Uh, more, more so by our offense and defensive line carried that team. Uh, we had we had real good offense and defensive line that that year, and we had taken Darren Howard from Kansas State, and he is a rookie. And Le- Leroy Glover, the D tackle, had like 17 sacks, and Joe Johnson, but. Um, uh, uh, Ricky didn't really become a pro. I don't think till he, till he got to Miami, and uh, I think that's when he became a pro. So, it, it, it was it was a tough deal for the kid, and I used to go check on him because he lived close by me. But uh, like I said, he would have people at his house and, and, and high school kids over there ride driving his cars, and uh, you know he, he just he, he just wasn't ready to he wasn't ready for the pros. Was there any temptation during practice to kind of let a defensive tackle get a nice clear shot at him to knock some sense into him? <laughs> well, no. I mean, they 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 would they wouldn't. I mean, they're not going to they're not going to try to take hit him hard anyway. You know, once you get into the season and in practice, if it's during the season, you're not going to hit your star running back hard. You're not going to try to take somebody that's a star player. I mean. He, 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 you know, you just felt, you know, a lot of people felt, you know, they, they felt for the kid because you're looking at where, you know, I mean, they put him, they put him in this situation. So, obviously, we're all in, in the locker room with him. And you got a lot of guys that are, you know, you got a lot of guys that are upset about, the, you know, them, them, you know, what's happening to him because he doesn't understand. You know, he's trying to come into the league. And, and you know, I mean, obviously, everybody thinks they're going to be Jim Brown or, this or that, or you know, and Ricky ended up having a good career, a solid career, but you know, he didn't understand what he was dealing with. And you know, when when managed, when, they, when you know, when people, when 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 you think or you perceive that people are laughing at you and laughing, you know, and you and you in this in this situation that you really have no control over. Once you've been in the league for a year or two and under, start to understand the business of the NFL, then like you said, you you know, you lash out and you do things that you. Uh, Probably regret, and I and I know he regrets that. He regrets some of the stuff he did, and uh, I, you know, I I I think Ricky and Ricky was uh was looked upon as a leader at the end of his career, especially in Baltimore. Those guys looked up to Ricky. Ricky was a hard worker. Now, Ricky came out and worked hard. He just was, uh, you know, he just was a little more aloof off the field. When you got traded by New Orleans to Kansas City, did it come as a surprise? No, not a, no. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you guys really know that told the story. You, you know, I was in a tough, tough predicament then. It was some uh, end with, endos about some family situations going on, and uh, you know, I've been there nine years, and you know, we won that playoff game. But uh, you know, at that time, um, I think that was the best thing for me. Uh, uh, with the situation the way it was, I wasn't going to go back to New Orleans and play football, and I and I kind of forced their hand. And the Saints paid five hundred thousand to trade me, and I had to go take a new contract with incentives and uh, mostly incentives. I went from supposed to sign a three-year, thirteen million dollar contract to signing, you know, a three-year, uh, eight million dollar contract, but but mostly incentive based and. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't change it any other way. I had to go earn my. Stri- I was, I basically, I had to go start over in Kansas City, and uh, you know, I went and saw Doctor Andrews and had that knee surgery, and uh, just blessed to come off. Just blessed to come off that surgery, and, and, and I had, had a knee scope in '98 and came back in 12 days, so the scope was a little different than ACL, but I knew I came back from a knee surgery pretty quickly, so. Uh, I was looking forward to that challenge, and I knew I, I knew I didn't want to end my career uh, limping off the field trying to play with a bad knee, and 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 I didn't want to end my career like that in 2001. So uh, I just I just was was looking forward to the opportunity to get the chance. I think the grass saved me a couple of years also. So uh, uh, you know it was it was a blessing in disguise that I went to. Uh, 
play in Kansas City with three other guys that made the Pro Bowl, another one that'll be in the Hall of Fame, and you know we we turned out to be one of the best lines. I think in that in that time we were the best line in the league, and uh, and we had a, we, we had a real good line, and and, and I was for, I'm, I'm very fortunate that uh, in the expansion draft for the Houston Oilers, the Texans uh, they took Tony Baselli that year, and they said they didn't want to take anybody over 30, and I was coming off of knee surgery, and uh, they didn't take me. And then the Bruselli went up there, and uh, he was battling his labrums and knees and stuff. And uh, like I said, that was the first major, major surgery. I just had back surgery a couple months ago, but uh, that was the first. You know, my body was I was starting to feel it, but I got to go up there and play on that grass. So, you know, I, I'm just glad I ended up going to Kansas City, uh, finishing my year, finishing my career up there, and uh, it, it's it's a it, you know, it was a blessing in disguise. I see that you're the all-decade team in the 90s and 2000s. Not many people can say they accomplished that. How did that feel? Uh, that, it, it was great. I remember uh, my agent, Peter Schaefer and Lamont Smith, um, I, uh, I was uh, calling. I didn't know if I was going to make it for the... Uh, I didn't know if I was gonna make make the all decade team for the uh for the nineties. And I was so anticipating getting a chance to make it and I remember calling my agent and I think Dan Patrick let him know that I made the team ahead of time. So I was just so ecstatic that I made it, you know, came in in ninety three. You know, you have to come in at a certain point early enough that you get to play most of the decade, but then you get to play a long time so you get to play in the next decade. But I remember finding out from somebody, it was him or John Clayton that let me know I made it. Um, and if I hadn't gone to Kansas City and played for the Chiefs, I wouldn't have made it for the 2000s. So, you know, it's great that I, I played the 2000 season in New Orleans, got hurt in 2001. So really I made that 2000 all-decade team, second team all-decade, not first team, and, and, the, and the Kansas City Chiefs. So, the fact that I got to go up there and have four real, four real good football seasons. Uh, our starting line the first two years didn't miss a game. John Tate left, went to went to Chicago for the next year. The other four of us didn't miss another game for three straight years, and then I got hurt the last year. Well, you know, Will Shields who beat me for the Allen Trophy my senior year. He hadn't missed a game. He didn't miss a game for 14 years as he got in the lineup his rookie year. And I think Casey Wegman started 11 or 12 years between Kansas City and Denver and back to Kansas City without missing a down for like 10 or 11 years. So, And Brian Waters has made the Pro Bowl four times, five times, and he's playing with the Cowboys now. And he made the Pro Bowl with the Patriots and the Chiefs. So, I mean, we, we had some pretty good linemen and, and uh, like like I said, I, I attribute it to uh, taking care of myself, especially late in my career when you're, you know, you're taking your tour, you know, you take your tour all shots during the week. You take your uh, anti-inflammatories, your tour all shots on game day. And, uh, you know, your body hurts after the game, but you, you know, basically you get on the, on the routine. So you go to the chiropractor. I would go to the chiropractor every Wednesday, but I had a massage every Wednesday night. And if I played on the road, it would be, Friday night, if I played at home, it would be a lighter massage on Saturday. So the stretching, the mas- the masseuse, the chiropractor, I remember coming into the league those first four or five years, I looked at them guys going to the chiropractor and stuff all the time. I said, man, what are they doing? Why do they? Why these guys need to go get this chiropractor, get these massages? Because, you know, I mean, I could just bounce back then. And as I got older, I started to realize, oh, now I understand why they need to get that done every every week. I didn't understand it. When I was young, because I was blessed with so much ability, but as I got older, I realized, you know, okay, now your your body your body starts hurting, and you need this, especially the, those those massages are, are key for you, especially when you get older. What's more painful, playing football or going to the dentist? Whew. <laughs> Depends on the dentist, right? It matters what you're getting done at the dentist. <laughs> if you're getting a bridge or a root canal, I say go Ooh. to the dentist. <laughs> I, how, did, how did you get the nickname Nasty? Uh, 
older in my in my career, I would mess with guys and do stuff in the locker room, or you know, just um, during the game. If you have to use the bathroom, you can't go leave the leave the leave the field. I mean, uh, that's what they make water bottles for. So you <laughs> take a knee, you take a knee on the sideline, you use the bathroom, and you got white pants on. You make sure. Well, obviously, you're drinking a lot of fluids anyway, so it's not going to be real yellow anyway, but. You know, you use the water bottle to clean it up to make sure nobody can tell. But you can't leave the stadium and use the bathroom. Jim McMahon told the story that his son was so scared during a game, he shit in his pants. McMahon went in the shotgun because he wanted to put his hands under center. <laughs> I heard that story, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I, no, I wasn't that scared. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. But, but if I had to, if I had to, to, to uh, Take a quick whiz. I wasn't going to hold it. I, I'm not going to hold it in the middle of the football game. I got to go out here and block some 300 pound guy. You know, I'm going I'm to take to make sure I get all those fluids out. Another thing, too, that you have to, you don't eat a lot pregame. See, even if you're a night game, if it's a, if it's a noon game, I, I, you might eat, I wouldn't eat more than just a handful of food because I wanted to feel light during the game. Or it matters who you played against. See, what, what Vermeil had to figure out about me was, I mean, if I'm 310, 312, and I got to go up against Richard Seymour, you know, I'm a little light. And, I, and the 3-4 defense, he's going to get underneath me. Now, if I'm playing against Dwight Freeney, I need to be a little lighter than I need to be against a bigger defense lineman than 3-4 because I got to move his butt off the ball. So, you know, we have weight, and I would fluctuate between 310 and, you know, 318. And if I was 318, uh, uh, you know, that would be two or three pounds of weight. Sometimes Vermeer would get mad at me. So you had to be careful what water bottle you were drinking out of, right? Yeah, you just had to make sure you got that. <laughs> make sure you went to the gym the night before and got those couple pounds. I've got in that steam room. What was it like going in the Hall of Fame? Uh, unbelievable. Uh, being there, being there with Forrest Gregg, being there with those guys. Uh, did you? Did you? Uh, you know, I never, I never had an idea. That, you know, some people say it's their dream to play football their lives. Well, you know, I, I, I never could have imagined, like some of those guys, of even going, thinking about, about him going pro, let alone all the fame. And I grew up a Steeler fan, big Steeler fan. You know, I always saw most people in that area were Cowboy fans, but I was a Steeler fan because we didn't have, you got the Raiders back, we didn't have a pro team. Uh, so me and Joe Green and Franco Harris, Terry Bradshaw, where I played college ball, I mean, I, I mean, you know, that was my team. And, and I'm in the hall with with those guys. And, and um, rest in peace, L.C. Greenwood, he played at UAP, UA, UA, M and N when he went to college before he went to the Steelers. But, um, you, you know, I was a big Steelers fan. So to be there with those guys, to be around, to be, I get to, you know, I still get to feel like you're in the locker room. You know, you go in there with you hanging out with Dick Buckus and and uh, Jim Brown, and uh, you go out at the hotel or at the Hall of Fame. We sit out there and I, and I listen to stories that Frank Belinskoff says, or some of the DBs are coming there that he played in the same age with him, and they're talking about guys and what these guys used to do and, and telling those stories. You know, you, you just get to soak it all in, and, and and it's wonderful for me to hear those stories. And soak it all in. And these guys talking about, you know, their careers and and and, and what what they what they uh, you know the experience they went through. Pooches. <laughs> I think the only guy more excited about you going in the Hall of Fame was your dad because he was just gone on the stage when you got your gold jacket. Oh yeah, my dad. I mean, my dad. My, I think my dad feels like I got to continue what he didn't get to finish as a football player. So, like I said, he was so excited for me to go in the hall. And um, and he was, he was you know, obviously very happy, and, and I was happy, and uh, the whole family. And like I said, the awards keep coming. Um, you know, going in, in the museum with my mom, you, you don't think that um, as a football player, you know, all, all that stuff can – how it's going to impact your family, but it does. And uh, like I said, it's, it's been it's been the whole Hall of Fame and everything since. I mean, going in the 
the Black Hall of Fame, the Arkansas Hall of Fame, uh, the Louisiana Sport. Any any time you go in the Hall of Fame, um, it's, it's a blessing, and, and I've gone in quite a few now. So to think I could I could do all this through sports is uh is, is wonderful, and uh, I mean I don't take it for granted. You know I appreciate it, and uh, you know my kids can, or my grandkids or whoever. You know, I remember growing up, and I had a cousin that, that played pro football. And I didn't get to meet him for a while, but, you know, they would always, when I was, well, you got a cousin that played in the NFL, and, you know, his name is uh, such and such. And, and, I, and I think I saw his football card one time. And, you know, I was so, you know, I was so excited, you know, that I had a family member that, that played in the NFL, you know. And, uh, and uh, you know, my family gets to go look at me and a whole bunch of, in different parts of the country, they'll they'll be able to see me in in, uh, in quite a few museums if they want to go see me uh, in Ken, You know they got that mural of me with uh, they got a mural up with me and um, and uh, uh, D. Emmett Smith and uh, Joe Montana and uh, and um, and Howie Long at the new part of the Hall of Fame. And, and, I mean that's going to be there. So I mean if my family wants to go see me, you know from 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 here till to return, you know, as long as you know the earth is around, they're gonna be able to see me, and and it's no telling how how they, you know, you know they have that those uh, new uh, those new uh, three those new uh, things where they kind of have your body, you know, the, the singer's body on stage singing with them. There's no telling in, in in time what they're gonna be able to do with these exhibits, you know, through the years. The, uh, in the future, so I mean, it, it, it's just uh, you know I'm, I'm so glad that that, that I got to achieve this, and, and, and like I said, a legacy of my dad looks forward to it because our family name gets to live on, and uh, people will always be able to go see us at all these different museums. The only mistake you made is your agent. You should have had your mom as your agent. Well, I think my my mom was my partial agent on my first contract, but I did wanted to have. Uh, uh, somebody that had dealt with the team, teams and know the GMs. I mean, it, it, it's, it's you know it's kind of a deal where you need to have people that kind of know those GMs and know how to talk to them. Because if you have somebody as your agent and it gets real heated, you know you want to have somebody. I mean, I'm not saying they need to be friends with them, but they need to have an understanding with these guys. So if if when you start negotiating and things go bad, they, they already know each other to a certain point. And it's, it's some type of respect there for each other. She probably could do a better job than Master P, though. <laughs> I think she would have done a lot better job. I, I think, yeah, I think she would have done a lot, lot better job. And I, and somebody told me the other day that Ricky Williams is coaching uh, some small college in uh, Texas. So I, I know he moved back to Austin, and they do, and they do have a statue of Ricky outside of uh, of the football stadium. Him and Earl Campbell. So I mean, Ricky was a great, great college. Football player. I mean, he was a good pro, but in college, I mean, the records yeah. he did, what he was able to do at, at Texas was uh, was was incredible. Now, your maternal grandmother was in Canton when you were inducted, and she said when you left Pee Wee team, you wanted to sleep in a jacket that they gave you. When you went into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, did you sleep in that yellow blazer? No, no, I did, I did not sleep in the yellow blazer because I wanted to hang it up. <laughs> uh, she, yeah, when I at the, after the banquet, yeah, I, I mean, you know, when I when I when I was when I I was so, you know, that 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 tells you something. I mean, I'm a grown man now, but 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 you know, at those different awards over your time period of growing up, I was so excited, you know, ecstatic to be on the team and get an award and get the jack. You know, you walk around school with your, your jersey on. You know, you have jamboree every week. So wearing your jersey to school was a big deal. Walking around uh, um, with that jacket, you know, getting that jacket, being a part of that team as a youth, it, it was, it, I mean, that, I mean, sports were just, uh, uh, they've always been, uh, me and my brother growing up, a huge part of a huge part of my life, and and and, and, I mean, and that's the way it was. I mean, and sports are a huge part of society. So, 
I, I was just so happy to be able to play and have fun and hang out with the guys. And you you got to run run those laps between those trees, and you got to get up and go to practice, even though it's down the street. You don't feel like going. And it's kind of it's kind of like a process to me of one level to the next, and, and you want to conquer each level, and you want to be the best at each level as you get older. And 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 and, and I just the the journey the journey of it all uh, you know your, when your life is pretty much consumed with sports you know you miss I, I miss that I miss the competition I miss the uh, you know going through it you know being out on that field running around and and just 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 going through that everyday process because it, it it becomes a big part of your life and, and when it, when that when that when that when it's gone. You know, outside of the competition, is just the whole process is, is, is real hard to fill that void. 